the exact timing and degree of stock market crashes is impossible to predict. What the heck is going on down here? But these six charts are actually incredibly good at warning us of how close we are to one. Let's go back to the 1920s for a moment. The decade known as the Roaring Twenties. New technologies were being invented, economic output was expanding, and the stock market boomed. Every year, better than the last. It felt like there was nothing that could stop the growth. And then, out of nowhere, it all came crashing down. The stock market down almost 90% over a three-year period. An unprecedented disaster that no one could have possibly predicted. Except, it was predicted. A handful of relatively simple measures were screaming to the world that the market was running way too hot. Normally, you could chalk it up to luck or coincidence, except that every time these signals are screaming a stock market bubble, it's been right. They're the signals that Ray Dalio uses to navigate the market, the man who built the biggest hedge fund in the world. And in a new LinkedIn memo, he shared what these indicators look like today. Not just for the broader US stock market, but also specifically the Magnificent Seven stocks. Because these charts aren't just useful at getting a picture of the broader market, they can also be used to spot bubbles in pockets of the market, like the tech bubble that started in 2020. As COVID hit the economy, the tech sector was actually perfectly positioned to benefit. You had large portions of the world spending far more time at home with more disposable income. More online shopping, more online advertising, more online entertainment, and increased use of work-related software. All driving astounding profit growth for the NASDAQ index, where most of the tech sector is listed. Lots and lots of money was flowing into stocks, with the NASDAQ rising more than 40% in 2020 and another 25% in November of 2021. The sentiment around this time for tech stocks was extremely bullish, and companies responded to that bullish sentiment by giving investors more stocks to buy. In 2020, the number of US initial public offerings more than doubled to 480. That's more new companies being listed on public markets than any year going back to 2000. And yet, in 2021, the number rose to a staggering 1,035. With inflation becoming a big problem, it became obvious that interest rates were going to be hiked. So sentiment swung the other direction and tech stocks began to fall. And in 2022, there were just 181 IPOs. Tracking the number of IPOs year by year is actually one of the ways that we can gauge the first of Dalio's six bubble indicators. Bullish sentiment. The more bullish the sentiment, the more people have already invested. So they're likely to have fewer resources to keep investing and are more likely to sell. As you might imagine, sentiment isn't an easy thing to quantify, but there are a few different ways that we can measure it. IPOs, for example, tend to increase when investors are bullish and decrease when investors are bearish, simply because the companies listing their shares publicly want to raise as much capital as possible. So they choose to list when investors are feeling good about the future. Another data point is options activity, which reached an all-time high at the end of 2021. Short-term euphoria in financial markets tends to lead to more short-term bets, which can in some cases be done with options. Dalio consolidates a number of data points to create his bullish sentiment bubble gauge, which you can see reached the 90th percentile in late 2021. Today, it's much less concerning, below the 60th percentile. Or in other words, the market is optimistic, but not overly so. For this category, Dalio gives it a no bubble rating. Within the tech bubble, which reached its tipping point in 2021, there were also some other pockets of the market where euphoria was forming. And one of the most fascinating ones to watch was AMC. Not a great week to be betting against AMC. This is not a short squeeze. They do not care what price they buy things at. Retail is selling to retail at ever higher prices. Just before we get to the story of AMC and Dalio's next bubble indicator, I'm just going to pause the video quickly to talk about the sponsor of today's video, BetterHelp. As men, opening up about our problems or asking for help isn't always the easiest thing. We tend to keep things bottled up inside rather than being vulnerable. I'll admit, I used to be the same way. I struggle with social anxiety and for years I never reached out for support. But pretending the problem isn't there just makes it worse. 
I needed help and I didn't know where to find it. Now, here's the thing. Therapy has been life changing for me. Having that safe, anonymous space to open up has done wonders. I know it sounds basic, but just being able to talk openly without judgment has helped me manage my anxiety and improve my self-confidence. I want all of you guys to know that it's okay to ask for help. And thanks to today's sponsor, BetterHelp, you can connect with a licensed therapist easily and privately online. BetterHelp matches you with a therapist based on your needs and preferences, and you can message them anytime about whatever's on your mind. Whether it's anxiety, relationships, grief, or stress, BetterHelp has thousands of therapists trained to support you through it. So take it from me and give therapy a shot. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash Hamish Hotter or enter the code Hamish Hotter at sign up to get discounts on your first month. Investing in your mental health is important, and this is such an easy way to get started. The movie theatre chain was struggling with a multi-decade secular decline in ticket sales, which reached a climax when they lost $4.5 billion in 2020 after being forced to close their doors. On the brink of bankruptcy, AMC was one of the most shorted stocks on the entire market. But in early 2021, the stock began experiencing large spikes in its price. Retail investors began piling into the stock with the hopes of forcing short sellers to close their positions, which would send the stock up even higher. Armed with their Robinhood accounts, tons and tons of new investors entered the market. The volume of shares of AMC being traded surged and so did the price. But none of the trading was actually based on the fundamentals of the business behind the stock. It was really just a flurry of a lot of new investors, particularly, that wanted to make a quick buck. And so the bubble inevitably popped. The stock is down 98% from its peak, and even 50% below where it was before the bubble started forming. The AMC story is an excellent example of Dalio's second bubble indicator, new buyers. He writes, a rush of new entrants attracted by rising prices is often indicative of a bubble. Often for a bubble to form, you need a lot of new investors who are going to be putting money into stocks without carefully considering the fundamentals of the business, because that's how the price becomes disconnected from the true value of the business. Retail trading volume as a percentage of total trading is one way to measure the number of new investors. The figure was extremely high during the COVID years, which contributed to all kinds of bubbles forming. Again, various measures of novice investor participation are combined into Dalio's new buyer's bubble gauge, which reached the 90th percentile during COVID. Today, it sits at the 55th percentile, which is slightly above normal. So Dalio gave a somewhat frothy rating for this category, and he actually gave the same rating specifically to the Magnificent Seven stocks. Of course, this wouldn't be a good video about stock market bubbles if I didn't talk about the two biggest bubbles of all, the dot-com bubble in the late 90s and the 2007 housing bubble. As the internet gained mainstream adoption in the mid 90s, companies with web related products were booming. And one of those companies was Cisco. Founded in 1984, they were a pioneer of the local area network, a technology that allowed computers in offices and on campuses to communicate with one another. And through the 90s, their modem and router products drove their revenues from 28 million to 12.2 billion. They were growing at an astounding rate, and many investors believed that that growth would just go on forever. At its peak, Cisco was valued at almost $600 billion. Even if you assumed the next two years of earnings projections were accurate, it was trading at a price 100 times higher. Eventually, of course, investors realized that their lofty projections for growth in the future of the business were not going to come true, and the stock lost over 90% of its value in just a couple of years. The Cisco story is the example Dalio uses to demonstrate his third bubble indicator discounting. In a bubble, stock prices will often be extrapolating revenue and earnings growth that is completely unsustainable. How extreme future expectations have become can be observed by looking at a stock's price to earnings ratio. The more expensive a stock is relative to its earnings, the more that earnings need to grow in the future to justify the price. The Magnificent Seven stocks collectively have a price to earnings ratio of just under 30, and their projected earnings growth this year is almost 25%. At the moment, there are certainly huge expectations for earnings growth, but so far it's actually been completely justified. The price and earnings of the seven companies have both risen very quickly. Dalio gives the Magnificent Seven companies a frothy rating for the discounting category. For the broader market, Dalio's discount gauge is at the 67th percentile, so it gets a somewhat frothy rating. Staying in the late 90s, the next indicator was also a prominent figure in the dot-com bubble. 
leverage. Investments can be financed with the use of debt and from time to time it can become excessive. Leverage in the stock market does two things. It increases the amount of money chasing the same amount of stocks, which helps to drive prices up, and it also causes forced selling in a downturn. When you borrow money from a broker to invest in stocks, you'll likely have what's called a maintenance margin requirement. So if the price of the stock falls, even if temporarily, you may need to put up more money or even be forced to sell stocks to cover your loss. US household margin debt as a percentage of GDP spiked in the dot-com bubble as lots of novice investors wanted to bet big on the future of internet companies. You can also see that it spiked leading up to the 2007 housing collapse and again in 2021. Today it remains elevated but there's no sharp increase which would be consistent with a bubble forming. Dalio's leverage gauge has us at the 23rd percentile today which of course means a no bubble rating. I've been saving the biggest bubble of all for a very unique type of indicator that is particularly relevant for real estate and commodity markets. Leverage, bullish sentiment and an influx of new participants were all prominent features of the housing bubble. Many Americans were convinced that house prices could only go up and it ultimately justified the use of adjustable rate or teaser rate mortgages. It didn't matter that your mortgage payment would balloon two to three times in a couple of years because by then the property would be worth so much more and you'd be able to refinance the loan. Lots of people entered forward purchase agreements with developers agreeing to buy a property that was yet to be developed. When the bubble burst, suddenly there was a huge supply of homes, no one to buy them, and a wave of forced selling as interest rates surged on the loans. The housing bubble is a great example of the fifth indicator, extended forward purchases. Are households, businesses, and even the government spending a lot of money today on the expectation of continued improvement in the future? In the stock market, one way you can assess this indicator is by looking at capital expenditures. Most businesses, of course, make investments for the future, but in a bubble, they begin spending lots of money on things like infrastructure based on the expectation that demand for their products or services will go up a lot. Another way to measure forward purchases is by looking at cash merger and acquisition deals, which shows the forward purchases of stock for cash, which was a big feature of the global financial crisis. This isn't a problem for the broader market in 2024, with the gauge reading just 38%. For the Magnificent Seven companies, Dalio gave them a frothy rating. A lot of money is pouring into the purchase and development of artificial intelligence services, and there are still a lot of question marks above how much money these companies can ultimately make from the models that they're developing. The last indicator is prices relative to traditional measures, which I saved to last because it's simultaneously the ultimate bubble indicator and also just completely useless. The true value of any asset is simply the present value of its future cash flows. What profits will the business produce in the future, discounted to reflect the fact that money today is worth more than money tomorrow. So the best way really to know if a stock is in a bubble is to simply calculate its value and then compare it to the price. If the stock price is way higher than its true value, then it's in a bubble. So it's really the ultimate bubble indicator except that it's completely useless when you're trying to assess the entire market. Because in that case, you would have to believe that you had the ability to value correctly every single stock on the entire market. And not even Warren Buffett can do that. Dalio, of course, does measure the value of every stock, but even he acknowledges that this is a low confidence area, especially when trying to value the Magnificent Seven stocks whose future profits depend on growth driven by generative AI. But regardless, Dalio puts the market in the 73rd percentile, earning the category a frothy rating. The six gauges are then combined into one bubble gauge, which has the US market at the 52nd percentile in 2024, not consistent with past bubbles. But even if the indicators were all screaming that we're in a bubble, that doesn't tell you when it's going to pop. In my personal view, it's not really a good idea to base investing decisions on broad expectations or predictions, positive or negative ones. Understand at a fundamental level the businesses that you're buying that's behind the stock, and you don't have to worry about the short-term fluctuations. Subscribe if you enjoyed, and consider checking out one of these videos next.